I talk about the three, as I was taught, the three cancers of the mind, which are complaining, comparing, and criticizing. The complaining, comparing, and criticizing are at lower frequencies and vibration. So if you're trying to operate from the point of view of like being a growth mindset person, being a person who wants to help others, being a good person, that vibration is bringing you down. Now, that doesn't mean that you reject people who do that or you don't care about them and you just push them away. But it's you also recognizing that if you have a different goal, you're not going to be able to achieve that from this frequency and vibration. Now, you may get to a point in your life where you're strong enough to lift people up, but until you're at that level, you know you're going to get pulled down. And I often think about the idea of if you saw someone drowning in the sea, if you were lifeguard qualified, you'd go and save them. But if you weren't, you'd go look for the lifeguard. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I want to help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm Pretty Intense. Today on the podcast is the amazing Jay Shetty. He's a best-selling author, podcast host of his own show called On Purpose. He's a former monk and a purpose coach. And what really came from this conversation is just how on purpose he really is with his life. He wrote a new book called Think Like a Monk. And there are so many examples in the book and calls to action and techniques about how to truly get to the core of yourself and to look inward and to start to realize what fear can do for you and what it's signifying. Jay is such a wonderful sharer. He has so many real examples. And we just had a really cool conversation where we were not only talking about his life in the past, but also the future and where it's going and perhaps maybe what we're being called to do. Thanks for doing this. Oh, thank you, Danica. Thank you so much for having me. I've been wanting to meet you for so long. So this is a yeah. real treat for me. Thank you. I feel like it's a long time coming, but it was good. It's all right on time. Just like everything in the world. It's all just right on time. Right so how's, how's 2020 been for you? I mean, I feel like this is like got to be like the most standard first question, but I don't think there's a way we can avoid this question because It's been a year of so much shifting and trauma and drama and growth and lessons and challenges. And so like, can you encapsulate the way this year has gone for you? Yeah, I think 2020 has been a year that I probably needed personally in in some ways. And at the same time, it's, I know for others, been a year that, they have lost someone or lost something and it's been truly crazy and had such a profound impact on the way they live and what they do and their career. And so first of all, I I lost a few people this year through COVID too. And so my heart goes out to anyone who lost anyone during this time. And at the same time, when I look at it from a purely individual perspective for myself, this year really gave me the stillness and the clarity that I potentially, despite my attempts to be still and mindful, potentially could have even missed because there's something really powerful when everyone has to stop and reflect and pause and question. And so for me, I think it was the most uninvited, unwelcomed stillness that has really, really helped me this year and in a way that I didn't expect and it was completely surprised. Mm, yeah, it, it, it brings me to a thought I've had many times lately and this is about um, spiritual teachers and gurus and leaders. Uh, is that nobody's perfect and that in fact these are the people almost that we're, we're needing it the most, right? Because that's, I mean, otherwise, why would you ever be so interested in this arena is uh, other than the fact that it's what you need as well. And so I think that it's really beautiful and humble and transparent to share that even though, okay, okay, like I think like a monk and I was a monk 
and I encourage stillness and breathing and meditation, that it's something that you needed as well. Yeah, I, and I, I couldn't, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't the case because everything is about depth and levels. And so no matter how deep you are, there's a whole universe that is still yet to be explored. Oh. And I feel like we understand that when we think about the outside world. So if you think about how many countries have you been to and how many cities have you been to and how many mountains did you travel to the top of or how many valleys did you go and visit? You, when you explore an outward space, you recognize that you have not understood the incredible vast nature of the planet we live on. And so when you think about going inward, we have to realize that that's almost a more infinite journey. And so for me, I consider myself to be a mindful, still, reflective individual. And I, was, I, was, I, did, I, have a, I had no idea what levels and, and depths were even more possible that were achieved during this time. Uh, in in a way of surprise, and so yes, I'm, I I I I thank you for for noticing that. But for me, it's it's very real, uh, and and I'm so grateful for that experience because potentially I could have missed some of this stuff for years, mm -hmm. and and time could have just gone by. And I think that's the hard thing about change and transition and years like 2020 is that they make us awake to everything all at once. Mm -hmm. And that's why it can seem overwhelming. But if in that overwhelm, we can pinpoint the areas and the essence of what we need to do, then it's almost like that overwhelm can help us push towards the right opportunity. Yeah, let's unpack that. You know, I was thinking of the saying new level, new devil. That's exactly what it sounds like when you're saying like the new the levels and there's depth to it. Um, but when let's say when you get into this space where you're starting to recognize something that needs to be shifted, unpacked, realized um, transformed, like what's that like? Like, what is, how does that go? How do you, where, what do you become aware of? What feelings do you get? And then like, what do you do? What's your process? I think the first thing is I try and look at it like a magic trick or the reaction to a magic trick. So I try and approach it with that sheer enthusiasm and joy and surprise of like, Wow, but from a magic trick perspective. So, if you want, I'm a bit, the reason why I say magic trick is I'm a big fan of David Blaine and Darren Brown. And mm -hmm. if, if you see a magic trick and you see that response and reaction someone has, you're shocked as to how you didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. But the shock feeling is of joy and enthusiasm and surprise, not of worry and fear. And I find that. A lot of the time when we discover we haven't been doing something, we usually judge ourselves. We rush from discovery to judgment mm -hmm. and judgment creates fear, a feeling of regret and, and a feeling of self-sabotage almost of like, why haven't I done it? I should have started this. How did I miss this? Oh my gosh, I messed up. And so we start creating this rhetoric and this pattern of judging ourselves. Whereas for me, and, and this was definitely what we were trained in as monks, it's that you almost have this childlike reaction to discovery. It's like if a child is digging away in a, in a treasure hunt and discovers a, discovers a piece of treasure, they're not going to be like, why didn't I find this 10 minutes ago? They're just going to be elated that they discovered it. And so when you find something out about yourself, I find that the easiest way to approach it is with that enthusiasm, joy, and surprise. So that's, that's step one. Mm -hmm. uh, after that discovery, now it's really important, like I said earlier, removing that self-judgment or that self-sabotage talk that can move us in the direction of, I should have discovered this. We should have been doing this. We messed up. We lost out on all these opportunities. After that, we, can, we, we start disconnecting and silencing that voice. It's really important to me to accept, well, what is the pathway or the plan to move towards making this a reality right now? Like, what does this actually mean? What do I actually need to do? Who do I need to become? What do I need to learn? And that's a really important step for me. And, and throughout the last, you know, probably 10 to 15 years where I've been really in this space of, of going internal, 
I found that there are, there are almost five stages to anything and they are learn, experiment, perform, struggle, thrive. And I imagine this, Danica, as a sort of pyramid. Mm. So you have learn at the bottom and learn. So if you look at the bottom of a pyramid, that's the widest part. That's the base. Most of our life should be spent learning the things we think we need to learn and a lack of confidence, a lack of certainty, increased overwhelm and a lack of confidence all comes from a lack of learning. Because as soon as you learn to do something, you feel more comfortable with it. And when you're not learned in an area, that's when you don't feel comfortable with it. So learning is the base. The next level is experimenting. When I learn something, the next thing I try and do straight away is let me experiment with this new discovery I've found. And that again is thinking like a child, because when a child comes across a spade or a spoon or whatever it may be, they're just experimenting. What can they hit it on? What does it sound like? Or what do I dig with this? What, what, how much weight can this carry? It's like you're just experimenting and being playful with it. And so now I've had this discovery or this realization. I'm like, okay, let me experiment with it. And then the third thing is I get into a pattern or a routine where I'm like, oh, this makes sense. This works. I start performing the same activity because I can see the result it's creating. And the natural thing that comes in life is this struggle. So it's like, okay, I found my rhythm and then all of a sudden I lost it again. What do I need to learn again to get back to that? And the final tip of the pyramid is thrive because the awards, the success, as you know, in, in your incredible career and your success in your journey, that's just like the tip of the pyramid. Like that, you don't even, ex you experience that for like 0.01%, uh, sorry, 0.01% of the time. That's not something you experience on a daily basis. Right. And so to me, that journey is, is usually what comes from a point of self-discovery. That's usually how I, how I process it. Mm. I, have I hope that answers your question. Sorry. Yeah, it kind of does. I mean, like, I, I think specific examples are always interesting because a lot of this language, while, you know, if you're versed in it and practiced and understanding it and you've read a lot, listened to a lot, listened to a lot of you, read a lot of, you know, amazing books, you know, you, you, this is not, this is easier to understand, but I think there's a lot of people that hear it and they're just hearing a lot of words, you know, okay. like it's, it's hard. No, I'm just, I think it's, real examples and like what happens when someone irritates you walking down the street and, you know, or, or what happens when your partner makes you angry or what happens when, you know, politics is bothering you or whatever, like how, what is it? What is that? You know, what is that process like, you know? Something yeah. Well I, well, I think that's part of the challenge too, Danica, that we're looking for quick, immediate, instant, specific fixes Mm -hmm. When actually the real challenge is there's a big root issue. Mm. And so what I mean by that is like, I'll give it. So let's, let's get, I get really practical and tactical in the book. So I'm, I'm always happy to go all in on real experiences. And, and I agree with you that a lot of this can become language and vocabulary. Uh, but the reason why it's important is let's say you hate your job and you decide that you're going to plan a holiday or a vacation or go to Coachella or you know, you're, you're going to do something fun this weekend to try and forget about it. Or you drink alcohol to numb yourself from the pain. Or you distract yourself with just spending time with friends. Those are all pretty poor attempts at trying to solve the fact that you don't like your job. Mm. Um, but we do that. We look for that instant fix, that instant solution. What's that habit? What's that hack? What's that activity? And actually, it's, it's, it's an internal uh, disconnect that you're actually trying to solve. And so I'm more than, let's, let's dive into certain examples, but the question you asked around, you know, how do you, uh, what do I do when I introspect? So I'll give you what I came up with. So I was, uh, it was the beginning of the pandemic. I was, uh, watching TV for the first time in a long time. I don't really watch TV at all. And the one of the things I chose to watch was the Michael Jordan documentary, which I think a lot of people ended up watching which funnily enough, wasn't a Michael Jordan documentary. I think it was a documentary about the, the Chicago Bulls, uh, The Last Dance. So I was watching that and I was watching it and a really big lesson hit me. And, and it was per personal and perfect for me. And it may be totally irrelevant to someone else listening, but, but for me, it was relevant. Mm. And 
there was a season in which Michael Jordan kept getting to the playoffs and they were losing and they couldn't get to the finals. They weren't quite breaking through. And Michael Jordan at that time realized that the thing holding him back and what was holding the Chicago Bulls back is they didn't have the depth of squad. They didn't have the right team next to him. And I believe it was the season after where they went and got the Dennis Rodmans. He went and invested in Scotty Pippen and he went and invested in developing uh, Steve Kerr. And he was almost like trying to build that squad of superstars around him so that they could achieve their results. And I was watching this and in my own way, I was observing and introspecting and asking myself, do I feel like I'm surrounded by people that help me grow in particular areas of my life. So I have my spiritual mentors and counselors. Uh, do I have the right people around me in my career? Do I have the right people around me in my purpose? Do I have the right people around me? I really started to ask that question deeply after many years of having gone through that exercise. And so I was learning. I was the first thing I was learning. I was like, Am I around the right people? Am I surrounded by what is wrong? What is it about the people that I have around me that may not be a 10 out of 10? Why is it a six? Mm -hmm. uh, what have I done to not attract the right energy around me? Maybe I've done something that hasn't created that, or maybe I've not been cognizant of it. And so that was my process of getting this amazing discovery. And rather than going, wow, I should have been figuring this out two years ago, which is that disconnect, Mm -hmm. My response was, well, let me go and learn. So I spent pretty much the last four to six months learning about team building, leadership, managing, inspiring, connecting with people, because I'm at a certain stage in my life where that's demanding of me, uh, as opposed to what was demanded of me three years ago. So to me, that was a very practical thing that I had to deal with, uh, which came from a very philosophical experience of watching this show. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it was like, okay. And so if we get into things like, I'm happy to dive into any specific. So you give me a specific uh, challenge and we'll go straight into it. This is exactly what I was curious about, like how it goes for you, a real life example of like something because, you know, that's the thing is it's like, I think that it's difficult for us when we're sitting in our own shoes to really recognize um, situations that come up. So sometimes, yeah, it comes through watching a documentary. Sometimes it comes through driving down the road. Sometimes it comes through, um, you know, like when you have to spend a week with your parents or something, you know, like you don't know when it's going to come through, but it can come through in so many various different ways. And so sort of unpacking the way that it goes for you when there's that introspection and that sort of aha moment of like, maybe is like, what's next, right? That's the thing. It's like, I think, uh, you know, I read in your book, the, the why game, I think that's a fantastic example, like a very easy process for how to start to try and unpack some of that stuff. Yeah, so that's I'm really glad you brought that up. So that so it's called the Y ladder or the or the Y game, as you said, in the book. And I have been talking about that in line with what's happening in the last eight months. So I'll give you an example. Uh, with me and my wife, we both are born and raised in London. We currently live in LA. So our parents and our sisters, and from my wife's side, my niece and nephew and my brother-in-law are all back in London. And when we found out the news that lockdown was happening at the beginning of the pandemic, and we wouldn't be allowed to fly back to London because countries had closed their borders, the first thing that me and my wife feared was the safety of our parents. Our parents are older, they're getting older, and we were worried about them. And the first fear in my mind was, oh my God, what if something happens to my parents? What's going to happen? Like, you know, I'm really scared about that. Like, how will they be safe? What if they get COVID? Right? Very normal fear. But with that, I asked, I used the why ladder. So I asked myself, well, why am I scared of that? Like, why do I fear that? And then my mind came up with another answer. And the answer was, well, I'm scared of that because I want to see my parents and I love my parents. And what if something happens to them and I don't get to see them and I don't get to be with them and, and I don't get to be around them and I don't get to love them. And so then I asked myself again, after listening to that dialogue, why am I scared of that? Then my mind comes up with another answer and it says, and it's coming up with a deeper answer every time. And it comes up with the answer of like, well, I'm scared because I love my parents and I want them to know I love them and I want to spend time with them and I want to see them and I want them to know how much they mean to me. Right. And then I asked myself one last time, why am I scared of that? Mm -hmm. And the answer that came to me literally changed how I felt the last eight months and my wife. Mm 
Wow. The answer was for me, I'm not showing them enough love right now. Mm-hmm. And that's something I can actually do something about. Yeah. I can't stop them from getting COVID. I, can't, I can tell them to be safe, which they have been. But what I can actually do is call them, FaceTime them, message them, communicate with them and tell them I love them, show them I love them, maybe send them their favorite thing during this time that will help them. I can show them what I'm actually scared. So what I'm actually scared about is not that they, they're unsafe due to COVID. What I'm really scared about is I'm not showing them love right now. Mm. And so that's a practical way of turning an anxiety into a point of action and doing something about it rather than getting lost in things I can't control, which is I can't open up the borders, I can't visit London, and I can't save them from this disease. I love how you explain to look at fear uh, and sort of welcome it as a part of the process and as something motivating as opposed to something that you just need to like push down or shove out or not have. And, you know, then that includes judgment and all kinds of things. I think that that's so refreshing. Yeah, I think, you know, I I think that we've just been trained as kids to either distract, avoid, or numb our fears and pain. So it's like, oh, you're scared of something? Distract yourself. You're scared of something? Just avoid it. Uh, And when you distract yourself, avoid from it, distract yourself from it, it's going to come back in some way. Uh, If you avoid it, it's just going to amplify. And if you numb yourself, so a lot of us just try and numb ourselves from our fear. And so what I often say to people is like, we, we all have two choices. Like you either escape your fears or you elevate and see them from a different lens and from a different space. And for me, that comes with that intimacy of trying to ask yourself, why am I scared of this? And what can I do about it? And, and getting close to your fear is, is the only way to remove fear of the unknown. I'll give you a really basic example. If you're scared of uh, a dark room in your house, if you don't go and check that dark room every night, you're going to be scared of it forever. And so you have to approach it. And so you may be scared of, like you were saying earlier, which Danica, I'm so glad that you're, I really appreciate you pushing me and you in this conversation into a practical space. But let's say you're scared of having a conversation with your partner. Right. If you don't have that conversation, if you don't understand why you're scared of it and start breaking it down, you're going to be the best fiction writer in the world, writing nightmare stories in your mind of what that could mean, how it could go, how they may react. And now you've just wasted a ton of energy. Whereas if you just ask yourself, why am I scared? And you realize I'm scared because I may lose them if I tell them this. Then the question you ask yourself is, well, how do I share it with them in a way they know I don't want to lose them, but I still need to address this. So you're almost reframing the conversation because you understand your fear rather than I don't understand my fear. I'm scared of losing them. So I'm just not going to address it at all. Mm. That kind of leads me into some other thoughts I've been having too about um, judgment. And so I was watching a video and it was sort of, framing judgment as being a reflection of something that you're denying in yourself. And I thought that that was just like, it was a moment for me. I was like, yes, because for me, like, let's say I judge, I judge people that are lazy. I just do. And when I unpack that and realize that, okay, looking at it from that perspective of, is this something that I deny in myself being lazy? And the answer is, uh uh-huh. (laughs) I completely do. Um, So I I think judgment is another thing that leads us down a path that's so similar to that fear and that, um, you know, uh, all those things that uh, are hiding underneath that help us really learn about ourselves because it's an inside job, right? Yeah. And the the only way and what you just said is, is beautiful and I couldn't agree with you more. The only way you remove judgment is turning it into observation and noticing. So you're always going to have an opinion on stuff. Mm-hmm. Not having an opinion is actually not realistic. So everyone has an opinion, you will always have an opinion, but your opinion can either turn into a judgment, which is usually fatalistic and kind of a bit, it's, it's almost like a conclusion. Mm-hmm. Whereas an observation mm-hmm. is a starting point. Mm. So judgment is like, 
oh, I, I don't like lazy people or I look down on lazy people. It's like conclusive. It's like there's an end to that thought. Right. Whereas a observation is a starting thought, which is like, let me explore laziness and why this person may be lazy uh, because I observe that they're lazy. I have an opinion that this person's lazy, but let me explore why they may be lazy or what's made them that way. That's the beginning of a conversation and a beginning of a relationship. Well, you said monks ask questions, right? Yes, yes. Monks do, they ask questions. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, that's the only, I mean, I, I think more and more I've realized even with myself, like I spend mo most of my days asking myself questions and you're doing it right now as an interviewer, asking people questions and, I, I think that we all don't ask ourselves enough questions. Like we don't check in with ourselves enough. We don't, we don't actually know. And the, what you were saying earlier is that only by switching off the conscious mind, can you actually hear the subconscious of how you actually feel. And, and, and a very practical example of that is if you're running around busy in life and hectic and you're just moving around and frantically, your body won't even allow you to fall sick. What happens is as soon as you stop, your body shuts down. Have you ever had that before? I, oh, that, I mean, like everyone has. Right, That's right. Really you're working really hard. You're busy. You're not falling sick. You're hacking it. You're getting through. And then all of a sudden you take that week off, you <laughs> fall sick straight away because you finally gave your body the time and space to do what it needed to do. So same with your mind. If your mind's always on and you don't pause and find that stillness in the day in whatever way you do, your subconscious doesn't get a chance. You'll find that if you stop, and even if I stop right now and we just take a couple of seconds and, and I'm not meditating, I'm just checking in with myself and I'm checking in and going, all right, what do I feel right now? My mouth's dry. I feel a bit dehydrated and I'm quite comfortable in this chair. And so... I, straight away, my body and mind have made me aware of things that I may not be aware if I talk through this whole podcast and this whole conversation without just checking in with myself. Right. I don't actually yeah. know. There you go. I don't actually know. And so many of us don't check in with ourselves all year round. Well, that's kind of shedding light on two really big pillars, I would imagine, of being a monk or being someone spiritual or being someone that's able to do that. And that's breath and meditation. Yeah. I I'm a big believer in at least at the beginning of, you know, meditation, just being this opportunity to check in with yourself. Like you're checking your notifications, you're checking your updates, you're checking in with your partner, your kids and going like, how are you doing? How's it going? Are you okay? What do you need? And, and it's almost like just having that with yourself is, is the beginning of all meditation because you're giving your body and mind and your subconscious an opportunity to communicate with you. Yeah. And they often know what you don't know because your conscious intellect and mind is so strong and conditioned and patterned and harmonized that you're just working from that place. Whereas when you slow down, you give an opportunity, like we said, with the body making you sick or with the body and mind helping you with what you're really struggling with. And so I find like that centeredness comes through stillness and there's a beautiful uh a tibetan buddhist leader has this beautiful uh statement he said that he said that what movement does for your body stillness does for your mind and and i found that to be so profound because we all know the feeling that we get when we exercise when we move when we dance when we work out we know what that like our body feels amazing from that movement but imagine what are we, it's actually the opposite for our mind. We need that stillness and space. So I encourage a lot of people very practically to find stillness and space. And when I say stillness and space, I don't mean you need to be on a mountaintop. I don't need, mean you need to be in a yoga class. What I mean is you need to find five minutes a day where you just get to check in with yourself and hear, and listen and observe uh, without having a negative judgment. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I've, finally started meditating for the good five or six months now, pr pretty much every day. Um, wow. And it's, it's beautiful. I mean, and, and with meditation, of course, there's, there's days where you get these huge downloads and transmissions and things happen and you're like, wow, that's 5d. That's amazing. 
And then there are times where you're like, so I sat there and I just thought about stuff for a while. <laughs> um, totally. And, and that's great. Like, it's the same as like, sometimes you eat dinner and you're like, that was the best meal I ever had. And sometimes you had dinner and you're like, that meal just kept me alive. Like, you know, it's it go like that for you, even being a monk. Like, does that happen to you too? It's, it's, uh, it's harder and harder. So I've been meditating now for a total of 15 years, um, for two hours a day for 15 years minimum. Ooh. And when I was a month, like two hours total or like an hour, most, an hour most of the, uh, the rule is two hours a day in a row. The exception is when I'm traveling or I woke up early for work and then my, my, my schedule gets disjointed. And then that's 30 minutes, four blocks each throughout the day. Got it. Got it. Got it. And so it, it does change now. When I was a monk, it was, we used to do sometimes four to eight hours in a row. And so that was very much, you know, deep discipline based. I, don't have as many meditations anymore that I don't find to be, um, you know, that, that I don't find to be useful wow. in that way. Because that's amazing, by the way. I mean, that's beautiful. It is really beautiful. And it, but it's just been so long. That doesn't mean that I easily slot into it every day. So right. if I'm jet lagged and I'm tired and I'm moving around, then, you know, it, I, I get challenged too. And that's what I often say to people is that the two hours is not an achievement uh, the the point is that you need to give it enough time for your mind to quiet down. So if you think about like switching off your laptop, before your laptop switches off, it asks you like 10 questions. Like, do you want to open up these files when you restart the laptop? Do you want to turn off this? And it's like, that's what your mind's doing. So when you're turning down your mind, when you're switching off your mind, your mind's like, oh, wait a minute, you haven't done this. Or what about this to-do list? Or what about this? And you've just got to wait for that to calm down. It's the same as when you turn a fan off, it keeps spinning for a while. Right. right. The fan doesn't just switch off. And so with our minds, we expect it to like switch off at the click of a button. Even your iPhone doesn't switch off and switch on at the click of a button. It still takes a moment. And so giving your mind that patience to just, all right, let me hear these thoughts out. Let me write that to-do list. And so sometimes that can take me longer than other times. But as soon as you're past that, that's when you're in, you know, and, yeah. and I think that's, we just that's have to recognize analogy such a great analogy. It's so true. Um, can you, do you have any um, story you'd like to share about some amazing transmission that came through some amazing download? Yeah, why not? Uh, I think one of my uh, best experiences with meditation happened in a temple in South India. And this is partly the method that I talk about in the book called location has energy. So I do believe that when you're in certain environments and you create certain environments in your home, they can allow you to access depth quicker. And so what I, and, and very practically, before I dive into that story, uh, I talk about how sight, sense, and sounds are three easy windows into being state shifters. So uh, for example, sight, when you look at something, when I look at a piece of art, when I look at the wonderful dress that you're wearing or top that you're wearing, when I look at the plants in your background, that sight has a certain trigger. When you look at the frames behind me and the people that are in them, it's like those, I don't just have these because they look cool. I have them because they invoke a certain feeling inside of me when I walk into this room. And so my question to people is, what is the first thing you see when you wake up in the morning? Is it a work of art? Is it a quote? Is it a paragraph in your favorite book? Uh, when you walk into your office, what's the first thing that you see? When you walk into your living room, what's the first thing that you see? Because I promise you that you can sight design your life yeah. so that you are inspired at every moment or you feel what you want to feel based on sight. They become like living mantras. You walk around, I mean, like no different than like a, a bracelet or something you wear that's significant is you're like, you know, this bracelet means this, they're like mantras. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And I think surrounding ourselves with physical triggers, visual triggers of things that help us feel certain things. Like if we're like, oh, you know what, whenever it gets to 3 p.m., I just get really tired and exhausted. Or, you know what, when I wake up in the morning, I'm just not inspired at all. Well, why don't you start changing what you look at when you wake up in the morning? So studies show that 80% of us look at our phones first thing in the morning and the last thing at night. So we're looking at our phones before we see our partners and our kids. And we look at our phones last thing at night after we see our partners and our kids. And guess what? When you look at your phone, you're looking at news, notifications, negativity, and noise. 
So you spend the you start your day at a minus four and you spend the rest of your day trying to climb up to zero, <laughs> which which is you're already setting yourself up for a harder journey. And so your visual trigger. So that's one. The second one is the trigger of a scent. And this is so underestimated. And I actually learned this as, as monks, we obviously had a lot of incense, candles, mm -hmm. uh, you know, natural fragrances that were around us. And we were encouraged to appreciate the, the true fragrance in a flower and to be mindful with it and sit with it and immerse with that experience. And I found this a, a few years ago after I married my wife. And what she did is she, and I didn't, I didn't realize that this was exactly what we learned as monks, but she made it very practical. Hence, I'm sharing it she had different diffusers and essential oils and candles burning in different rooms in the home. So when I would walk into the living room, I would breathe in and it would be like lavender and I would automatically feel calm. And when I walked into the bedroom, it would be sandalwood. And when I would breathe that in, that would remind me of sleep. And so what I found is that you can actually scent design your life away from stress because why is it that when you walk into a spa, or a massage therapy space that you feel relaxed, it's usually the scent. You breathe in sandalwood, lavender, eucalyptus, and all of a sudden, so every morning when I'm in a shower, I'll put a few drops of eucalyptus and just breathe in and out, and you will just feel different. Like it, it is chemically affecting you, right? It's literally yeah. chemical, but chemically, yeah. biologically shifting your state. Yeah. And so for me, that's been a huge one. Mm. Uh, and the third one is sound design. Uh, I, I researched this when, again, as monks, like you said, mantra, we would chant mantras, we would hear mantras, we would hear gongs. People associate monks and gongs. There's a reason because the vibration from a gong mm. is in These are all crystal balls. There we go. There They're we go. All, oh, I love those. Crystal balls. It's, uh, it's all seven, seven chakras plus the eighth. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. I had no idea. Well, there you go. So that's a perfect example of like, the power of frequency and vibration. And so I was saying the same to people in life today. It's like, how many of us have a playlist for our ideal day? Yeah. Like what's the sound you want to wake up to in the morning to get you inspired? What's the sound you want to hear in the evening to help you wind down? What's wow. the sound you want to hear at 3 p.m.? It could be nature sounds. It could be gongs. It could be singing bowls. It could be sound bowls. It could be your favorite song by Taylor Swift. What, like, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, but why have we not created a playlist for our day? And these are really simple, basic life changes that anyone can do to shift their state throughout the day. And the challenge is most of us are exposed to insignificant sound. So I used to live in New York City and I always questioned why I felt tired sometimes at the end of the day. And I discovered or researched something called cognitive load. And what this theory was suggesting is that when you're listening to drilling, phones, sirens, uh, you know, what would be considered as insignificant, irrelevant sound, your Love that brain, New York. <laughs> yeah, exactly, New York. Your brain is trying to make sense of that sound, but there is no sense to it. So your brain is wasting energy known as cognitive load. Your brain's load is being wasted 80% on insignificant sound. And so hence, if you are traveling, I mean, not many people are right now, but headphones and travel or listening to a podcast like Danica's or an audio book or... or your favorite song, like just any of that. Uh, anyway, so that was a long winded practical answer to what you asked me about a meditation experience, but I'll get into that once we, we share this. Yeah. Well, that was, I mean, that was that that's going to lead me to another question. I totally want to hear your down, like some, <laughs> some fascinating, uh, uh, amazing sort of quantum field experience, but um, but it makes me think of right off right then is is this is for people too. Think yeah. about how much no, you know, like yes, there's those ambient noises, but what if there's people? What if people complain and they don't actually want to? I think it says you write, write about that in the book. It's like some people don't want to figure their problems out. They're just there to complain. So, you know, those to me sound like the same thing. It could be the news, which to me is just distraction. So like that's, you can't use logic to solve something illogical. And there's a lot of things that go on, whether they're in the news or whether that's in our life or someone complaining, that it's illogical. And so when you try to apply logic, you're just wasting your energy. 
Absolutely. That is so well said. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that idea of us taking responsibility because so I talk about the three, as I was taught, the three cancers of the mind, which are complaining, comparing, and criticizing. Ooh. The complaining, comparing, and criticizing are at lower frequencies and vibration. Right. So if you're trying to operate from the point of view of like being a growth mindset person, being a person who wants to help others, being a good person, that vibration is bringing you down. Now, that doesn't mean that you reject people who do that or you don't care about them and you just push them away. But it's you also recognizing that if you have a different goal, you're not going to be able to achieve that from this frequency and vibration. Now, you may get to a point in your life where you're strong enough to lift people up, but until you're at that level, you know you're going to get pulled down. And I often think about the idea of if you saw someone drowning in the sea, if you were lifeguard qualified, you'd go and save them. But if you weren't, you'd go look for the lifeguard. <laughs> and, and you'd go, lifeguard, can you come and please save that person? Because you knew that you would just get pulled down anyway. Yeah. And so real compassion isn't just staying in a complaining culture community. Real compassion is introducing your community to the teachings, the wisdom, the guides, the coaches, the mentors that can help everyone out of that drowning state. Uh, and often we look at false compassion and false compassion is like, oh no, I just have to stay there with this person and help them out. But hey, what if you stayed with that person in the drowning sea and you both just drowned? That's not good for either of you. And so it's important to recognize that. Uh, but, but yeah, going back to that, the, the experience that I had. So this temple in South India and South India has some stunning temples uh, and you can just Google South Indian temples and you'll see the architecture is just phenomenal. Some of these mm. temples are like two to 5,000 years old. So they are old. Like they are, you know, the, the brickwork, the, the um, brick, I don't even think bricks, the bricks, yeah. even, but the, the stonework, sorry. And, and the architecture is just phenomenal. And when I was inside those spaces, uh, you just, you, you genuinely feel transported to another realm. It's almost like watching, I don't know if you've ever watched Doctor Strange. Uh, and, and if you haven't, then I, I recommend watching Doctor Strange. It has a lot of brilliant philosophical messages. But in that movie, you, you almost imagine being in a different realm, even in the world. And there's one temple in South India that has this incredible corridor which is like pillars and pillars and pillars and pillars and pillars. And, and you can meditate in that corridor. And in that corridor, it literally feels like it's a gateway to another dimension. And so there were parts of that meditation where I literally felt like I was being transported dimensionally through. And when you, when you just look at the picture, you will, you will feel it just by looking at it. You don't even need to be a meditator. But when you meditate there, you can truly feel the most outer body experiences that you could possibly have. And a big part of uh, the teachings that I studied is the recognition that we are not this body, that we are something beyond this body. We are consciousness. And, and that having that experience for me of feeling outside of and more than my body uh, is probably the deepest experiences I've ever had with meditation um, that I can share of that genuine feeling that I'm not my body. And this is just a container and a vessel and a vehicle mm. and that I'm a consciousness beyond this. And so are you. And so is everyone else. Mm. And experiencing that is pretty, pretty special and remarkable. And were you uh, watching it, were you watching yourself or were you purely transcended as in like, there was no awareness for, for Jay with, you know, the blue jacket and the, what, like, there's no awareness for the body that you're in, like, as in you felt a part of everything. Is that, am yeah, I? So, I yes, I correct. So, so, so right? yeah. So a good example from other experiences, often we would meditate in uh, extreme cold or heat. And, and the purpose of that was to, when you're in that much physical pain, you have no choice, but to go inward. And so it's almost like you enter into the inner world and the inner universe of the, the connectedness between everything. So you're no longer feeling the physical connection with the body. Like right now I'm sitting, I can feel that I'm sitting yeah. and I can feel that my leg, you know, I've crossed my legs because I've always feel comfortable when I cross my legs on chairs than sitting with my legs down. And so, but I can feel that I'm doing that. I'm conscious of it. Whereas my point is losing that physical consciousness of yourself. 
Mm. And to not feel like you're even sitting here, to mm -hmm. not feel yeah, like you're in this physical space, mm -hmm. uh, to, to really experience that has probably been one of the, my favorite experiences of meditation. And I don't try and, and the goal isn't to feel that. Like that's not, right. that's where people get d confused. Like I don't meditate to feel that. Right. Uh, when you meditate purely and deeply, you experience that as a byproduct. And so it was very, very clearly explained to us that you're not meditating to be powerful or gain powers or gain these mystic abilities. That's not the point. Like you meditate to build up the deepest connection with yourself and others in the universe. And a byproduct of that is that you may experience this. A little non-locality. Yes. Um, I've been thinking about, um, you know, we're talking about distraction. We're talking about feeling things in our body. Um, getting in touch with that pausing stillness. And so a thought that I've been having is that we don't know what to trust anymore. We don't know what news to trust. We don't know what movies or documentaries to trust, like what's propaganda, who paid for it. Um, you know, what's really real going on in the world. And so I just have this thought that we're entering this new, new sort of phase of existence where, and I'm curious if you, what you think about this and if you've thought about it is that we're being asked to go inward and to learn how to feel into our body, to learn how to be able to then discern truth from lies through resonance in our body, in the awareness and the knowing that we, that arrives through situations, um, because that's all we have left now. Mm -hmm. And that this is, I feel as a very untapped, unending potential. Yes. Yes. I, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, I think the ability to be independently thoughtful mm -hmm. has been lost on the desire to be consumed by the direction of society. We've almost let society direct us and guide us. And we all know that. And we know it happens in many different ways. And, you know, one of, one of the funniest ones for me was, uh, I remember when I was proposing to my wife, which was about six years ago now, when she was my, you know, when she was my girlfriend and not my wife. And I remember asking my guy friends who'd proposed about, you know, where do you buy a diamond ring and how, how much do you pay for it and all that kind of stuff. And I remember looking into it and they told me that, Jay, you know, you buy a diamond ring, you can buy it from this shop. Uh, and, you know, these are the kind of cuts you're looking for. And you usually spend two months salary on it. Like that was the, the rule of thumb that I was given by all these people. And I started looking into it and I was reading about it. And this was actually more like probably a few years ago, not, not during that time. And I bought the ring, I proposed and all the rest of it. And then I came across this, this study or this, this article that I was reading. And it was talking about how actually that idea came from the diamond industry. So diamonds were not even used to propose to people until the 20th century. And they were not a part of that culture, but the diamond industry wanted to make diamonds more integrated into obviously a big human decision of getting married. And therefore they were marketed in that way. And literally, if you go on YouTube, you can type in De Beers commercial and De Beers actually has a diamond commercial. Not only does it say a diamond is forever and show the love between a man and a woman and a proposal, but literally at the end of the advert, and I'm not kidding you, it says, how else can you make two months salary last forever? Like literally in those words. And I was shocked because I was thinking this culture from De Beers advertising has stemmed all the way into my friends in London who are all South, like those people that I asked were South Asians, I, I, people of my, my background and descent. And how is, and none of them know why. Like when I was like, why do you spend two months salary? They were like, oh no, that's just, you know, a rule of thumb. Like as if it was like a fact. Sure. And, and, you know, even today it's like, we all think about diamond rings when you think about getting married. No one goes, oh, we're going to get a 
gold ring or we're going to get this. Like everyone thinks of diamond rings, but that was literally programmed into society. So we've all been programmed in different ways. Totally. But the interesting thing about that is just as we got programmed to ask a diamond ring, why did we never ask ourselves, well, what would be the sweetest way to propose to my partner? Right. Like why, why would I not think of the most unique, special way to propose with an item that it, why does it have to be a ring? But we right. never asked that question because we adopted a pattern of society. And so mm-hmm. I would encourage everyone. And, and I think that's what you're doing. And I love that is to ask, to, to study, to read, to research. I think that's very important. And I'm a big believer in, you know, timeless and ancient wisdom, having so many answers uh, that, that, uh, correlate with modern science. And that's what Think Like a Monk's based on. I basically went and found all the scientific studies that back, that back the activities of monks that have been done for thousands of years. And so I love the, the synergy between ancient wisdom and modern science. But at the same time, the third part of that synergy is how does that fit with me? Right. And, and I think that that question is the question that's been missing. And to me, that starts with the simplest thing. Like when you watch a movie or you eat some food, ask yourself, did I like that movie? Yes or no? What did I like about that movie? Why did I like it? If you ask yourself those three questions after eating something, watching a movie, meeting a person, I promise you, your self-awareness will go through the roof. But usually what we do when we meet someone is we meet them, we hang out, we have fun, and then we never think about it. We never actually take a moment to reflect. But if you literally just do that, like, wait a minute, did I like that movie? Yes or no? Did I like hanging around with that group of people? Yes or no? Okay, what did I like about it? Why did I like it or not? And if you simply do that after every activity or experience, your self-awareness will rise so much that the quality of your intuition will be so strong that your intuition will start to guide you. It reminds me of a simple like Instagram quote I saw many times, which is, I think it's something like, stop saying yes to shit you hate. (laughs) (laughs) Because how many times do we do stuff that we're like, oh, well, yeah, I do it because I'm programmed. I do it because I have to, but do I am doing it because, oh my God, I hate doing that. (laughs) So true. And, And I think that understanding that we have a choice and, and often what we do is we get overwhelmed and we go, oh, no, there's just too much and nothing's true. Or, and, and that feels like the easy way out. Or sometimes the, e- the easy way out is either nothing's true and nothing's real. Or the other easy way out is everything's true and everything's real. So I follow everyone and everything or I follow nothing. And actually what we need is that middle ground of finding mm. the groups of people we take advice from, the mentors, the counsel, the coach, the, the things we do value because we all need that but also keeping a healthy ability to question that and Mm. and look beyond it. So it's almost like there's a loyalty, but there's also the the ability to learn even within that loyalty. Yeah, loyalty, the things that you question um, as well. It reminds me of another thing that I've seen, um, uh, a religion called omnism, where you don't believe in any one religion, but that there's truth in all of them. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I would agree with that. I, th- I think that that's, uh, I, I think the essence of, of all spiritual and religious practices ultimately are ex- exactly the same. Uh, and, and often, yeah, what, what's blocking us is, is far more our laziness, <laughs> coming back to what you were saying, uh, is our laziness to commit to anything. And that's why we go, oh yeah, I don't believe in any of it. Because that's also a sense of, I don't have to commit. I don't have to work. I don't have to do anything about it. Yeah. Why are you spiritual? Would you call yourself spiritual or would you call yourself religious? I'm not, I'm not trying uh, to sort of put yeah, you no, in no, no, the box. No, no. Why do you follow this path? Yeah, I, I would call myself spiritual for sure. Uh, but I, I think I'm in a space where I value both spirituality and science and steps and strategy quite equally. So I kind of see them as part of my path. So my path is and, and that's what the book does. And that's what all parts of my life is. My path is, and any content I create or anything, my path is like, what's the spiritual perspective? What's the scientific perspective? And now what are the steps and strategies to help people live it and help me live it? Mm. And so I think like life is like so much more about embracing polarities and paradoxes as opposed to like, I'm spiritual or I'm scientific. I'm strategic or I'm sincere. To me, it's like, I want to be strategic, spiritual and scientific because that's the mix that helps me live. Uh, The reason I I follow this path is 
I was very fortunate when I was 18 to obviously connect with monks, to connect with spiritual people. And in, you know, I'm, I've been really fortunate in my life to meet such a wide array of people, everyone from when we were monks, you know, serving homeless communities, helping build sustainable villages, feeding children with nothing in India on the streets, all the way through to having met and spent time with billionaires and, and famous individuals and coaching and working with people of, of literally people from all different backgrounds and walks of life all across that spectrum. And materialism just doesn't have any answers. Just, just simply put, like materialism has zero answers. The, the material pursuit of success and happiness in and of itself is limited and ultimately, I've seen people, whether they've conquered it or are trying to conquer it, have ultimately turned to spirituality in, in every sense. So not only from my own experience have I had amazing spiritual experiences, but from having observed human experience, uh, material things are a need, a necessity, and are useful and important, but they are not the goal. And so... We, you know, I don't idolize or demonize materialism um, because I live in the world. I make money. I'm an entrepreneur. I have a home. I have a car. Uh, I value all of those things, but I don't value those things to give me a sense of happiness, joy, fulfillment, or purpose. But I do value them as they are, as tools and energy. And so I think the reason I chose the spiritual path and, and continue to do so is because I see people of all different backgrounds and walks of life ultimately turning in that direction, uh, regardless of what they've achieved or what they haven't achieved. Mm. So encapsulate sort of the burning desire in you. Truth, yeah. Like, oh, sorry, go on, Danica, go on. Like, yeah, like, it, you know, truth, or it, would it be just like uh, waking up, pe waking people up? Or would it be, um, you know, what, would it, what, is the, what is the purpose of it all? The purpose of it all is simple. It's, it's, I found a way of life that brought a great deal of fulfillment and purpose to mine. Mm -hmm. So I feel a sense of responsibility to pass it on. Mm -hmm. It's like having just, if you just found the cure to cancer, you'd want to share it with everyone if, if, if you found it because you never want people to suffer. So I feel like I found the cure to a lot of our issues and challenges and I found them through these amazing teachers and so I feel a bit of a weight of responsibility in a positive sense to pass them along because if I didn't I'd feel like I'd done a disservice to the people that helped me and the people that served me because what if we could help everyone remove their suffering or limit their suffering and navigate their suffering actually as opposed to just saying oh yeah I found a way out of mine and, you know, good for me and, and let, I'll let you figure out on your own. And like, like, you know, I think me and you both agree with this. There are multiple paths. There are multiple ideas. Uh, there's many different teachers and guides and coaches and whatever it may be. Uh, and when I started out, I just really wanted to share what I'd learned. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And thankfully, it's helped people and they've, you know, they've connected with it. But I never had any imagination or desire close to that. The, the impact that's been made so far is anything that we would ever have got to. So it's, it's a blessing and I'm humbled and grateful for it every day. Mm. It reminds me of what I've said so much in the last probably year is that we're all just walking each other home. <laughs> I Run love up. that. That's yeah. beautiful. That's like, so I mean, That's such a beautiful know. vision. You know, it's, but it is, it's like somebody can be like, oh my gosh, thank you for doing that. You're like, don't worry about it. We're all just walking each other home. You know, <laughs> that is such um, a beautiful visual. Thank you for that. You've just given me a huge gift. I love that. I love it. And some people, of course, like yourself are, you know, playing really big roles in that and taking that responsibility on. And, you know, I speak for so many people when I say thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for um, going in so that you can put it out there, what you're doing and give us all tools. Cause I mean, it, I mean, if that's one thing that I've learned so far in this book is there's like so many tools. I was just saying before we started to my producer, I was like, 
I think you could take like each chapter and make it a month of your life because there's so much applicable information in here and so much, so much, but so much training, like train your mind for peace and purpose every day. Like it is a reprogramming. And so like, this could literally be your guide for the year. And um, so thank you for, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for sharing. And um, you know, I hope this is the first of many conversations we have. Yeah, well, no, thank you for, for doing what you do. And, and thank you for pushing me at the beginning to, to be more specific and practical. I love that. And, and, I, and I'm grateful to you for that because uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I, the last thing I want to do is, is speak in uh, intangibles. And so thank you for encouraging me to do that and, and uh, recommending us to do that today because I think that hopefully will help people. And, and yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I, I think everyone, I genuinely believe, and you know this, you, you've, you've achieved so much of this in your life. And I can't wait to learn more about where your mind space and heart space is right now. Uh, but, you know, everyone does have a unique purpose and calling. And this book begins with my favorite verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which says, it's better to follow your own path imperfectly than to follow another's perfectly. Mm. And, and to me, that is the root of all of our growth or issues because I'm just trying to follow my path the best I can. Uh, I genuinely feel I'm doing what I was meant to be doing and what I was born to do. And, and uh, I feel very aligned in that sense. And it's taken me a long time to get here. And I'm still trying to constantly align every day. It's not like it's done and it's achieved. And, and I just want everyone to align with their greatest calling because we need everyone in this world um, to live that way. We don't just need a few people. We need everyone to feel aligned with their purpose and their, their calling. So thank you for allowing me to share this with your community and, yeah. and uh, your audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.